I want to start out uh, by mentioning uh, a discussion that I had with uh, Bakari Sanogo yesterday. Because I think it's something we'll all relate to, and it's also why this focus on gender equality. And I quote, in Africa, we are still confronted with gender inequality, with girls not given the same opportunities as boys. My personal experience drawn from my family shows that without gender fairness or equality, it will be hard to attain true development in Africa. I'm from a family of 14 with seven girls and seven boys. My parents were peasants from the north of Côte d'Ivoire. They moved to Boaké, a middle-level city in the center of the country to make a bit better living. My father and his two wives were not educated people. They never went to school. So we understand easily that they brought with them their habits, traditions, prejudices, etc. One of the unfair treatments my father gave to my seven sisters was not to send them to school. The reason for this is that they were just female. Of course, his wives had no say in this matter because they were women. Sending them to school would have meant losing control over them because he would not have been able to marry them to the people he had already selected. They would have been modern girls with bad habits. The result was that these girls, now women, throughout their lives have been going through all sorts of difficulties. Difficulty to improve their material conditions, hardships to own land, total illiteracy, but to mention a few. A minimum of education, even basic primary education, would have helped them to cope with, challenge, with the challenges of lives, take better care of their lives, be equipped to start a small business, provide better health care to their children, etc. close quotes. Now, Bakri's story is not unusual on the African continent. And I've heard some applause, but I see many of you shake your heads because this is a reality that we're dealing with. So the development and implementation of a gender strategy that the African Development Bank, the board adopted on the 22nd of January 2014 was based on a number of issues. And I'm going to quote another African. And the one that I want to quote is actually the Nigerian finance minister, Ngozi, and she said in July loss, uh, in 20, July 2012, and I quote, women are the third largest emerging market on the globe. Women are the third largest source of growth. And one of the fastest ways to sustain current growth is to invest in women, close quotes. This is about the smart economics issue. It's about the rights required that Bakri spoke about. It's about the economics. And it's around the three pillars of the strategy of the bank. And this strategy is, is anchored on three mutually reinforcing pillars that is drawn from the bank's 10-year strategy. And these are strengthening women's legal and property rights. And Bakri made the case for that. So if you were unconvinced before, I'm sure you've changed your mind. But I also want to say to you, coming from South Africa, and Southern Africa in many instances are considered to be advanced in areas. As recently as in 1997, a businesswoman who opened a bank account to start a business, as she was starting a business, needed her husband's permission. That was 1997. It wasn't 1897 and 97. It wasn't 1960 when I was born. We're talking about yesterday. We also have a particular reality that in the DRC as we speak, 
for women to travel, they need the permission of their husbands or a male guardian. The same goes for North Africa. So we're talking about current realities. And people have ways to deal with this and various uh, ways of dealing with this. And there are various examples that are given. But as uh, was stated, I mean, many instances, the reason given is culture. But as was recently said by uh, Ban Ki-moon, he said, preserve the best in culture and leave the harm behind. And I think all of, the, all of us who are part of understanding the dynamism of culture and tradition will say that we know we've got to retain the best and leave the harm behind. And I raise this as well because as many of you are aware that on the 6th of, 6th of February was International Day of No Tolerance to Female, female Genital Mutilation. And we know that if FGM and child marriage share, uh, shares a common root, the ingrained idea that women and girls are somehow inferior, and we must, uh, so I think what is very clear is that we must end these harmful practices. Because women are the third largest emerging market on the globe, if we don't believe in anything else, and we know that one of the fastest ways to sustain the current growth, the projected growth of 6 to 8% that we all talk about, is to deal with this issue. Now, before I go back to the strategy, and I promise you I'm not going to go into the detail of it, because I know everyone who's here today has read the strategy in absolute detail. You actually know every part of it. And so we're not going to go in every detail, but I'm going to give you some pointers to that. You know, in 2012, um, the Minister of Economic Infrastructure of Côte d'Ivoire, Patrick Achi, when he participated in the ADF 12 midterm review in Praia, Cap Verde, in September, he said, when speaking, he was representing the governor for Côte d'Ivoire. And he, when speaking on the issue of gender, he says the issue of gender is not imposed on African governments. And I'd like to quote him by saying, he said, it is for us first that gender equality is a crucial issue. We are not putting gender at the heart of our development strategies just to please development institutions or donors. It is in our own interest first. It is in the interest of our countries because half the African population is composed of women. And obviously, we will not have development or get developed if that half is left out just because they are women, close quotes. So if anyone thought that we are doing it because we're pandering to an external agenda, let me assure you that we're doing it because it's necessary. We're doing it for Bakari's mothers and his sisters. We're doing it for my mother who had to leave uh, school at a young age because she, she had a widowed mother and she needed to ensure that her sisters and brother gets to, through university. So it's not an unusual story. It's about our lives and it's about our daughters, it's about our sons as well. Because this agenda is not about leaving anyone behind. So it's not just about women. So I'm told that many of the men in the bank are very worried if there's a recruitment panel and there's a woman on the panel. They also very worried if they heard that the shortlist has a woman on the shortlist because it's unlikely they'll get the job. But the African Development Bank at this particular point in time, with its commitment to the 10-year strategy and a commitment to transform the African economy says, we must ensure that we are an employer of choice. And we've heard President Donald Kabaruka 
on the whole issue of the inclusive growth agenda. And the inclusive growth agenda is about leaving no one behind. So worry if uh, there's a panel, because you should be worried about whether you are good enough, not whether you're a man or a woman. It's whether you are good enough, because we're talking about an agenda of inclusion. And hence, this strategy, the one that you've read, seeks to change the DNA of the bank with regard to gender equality. It's not just an external strategy, it's about addressing the bank's own transformation and ensuring that it becomes a gender responsive institution. So the bank leadership is one that leads by example.